So for the most part, all of the operating system specific knowledge that Crowbar has, okay, we are up here. Where's the mouse pointer? Is that even it? Ah. Where is your mouse pointer, Rob? Oh, that's why. Possibly. Yeah, stupid VMware. Anyways. Okay, so all the operating system specific knowledge that uh, Crowbar has is in all of these Red Hat and Ubuntu extra directories. Okay. And in each one of those, let's just pick Ubuntu Tintin for example. Wow, that it's is just, it's just that is laggy. laggy. Come on. Wow. It's scared of you is the trick. That's how I enforce my will <laughs> upon all of these servers. <laughs> The actual build specific knowledge for each operating system, um, because all everything that's in here, everything that's at the top level crowbar directory is essentially part of the build system. Um, all of the stuff that's, all, all the stuff that you see for like the crowbar UI and whatnot, that's all down in the crowbar bar clamp. And it itself doesn't really know or care about uh, operating systems. But um, whenever we want to go build an ISO, there are a lot of things we have to do to make sure we get all the right packages. So the first thing is that we have to know where to fetch all the packages. And that is actually handled in the bar clamps themselves. So take the crowbar bar clamp for example. So as, as a note along those lines, to add operating system support, you will have to touch every bar clamp that you want to support that operating system which involves every core bar clamp for yeah. crowbar. So for Ubuntu 10.10, it knows where all of the upstream repositories are, so that it knows where to fetch packages. And 11.04, it knows what those are too. And page down doesn't work here. And then once we get to the actual package list, it has a list of all of the packages that that, that, that bar clamp requires. And the crowbar bar clamp uh, has a lot of packages, mainly because it hosts all of Chef. And it hosts all of the web server infrastructure. So it's got a lot of stuff in it. And then for each of the operating systems we support, we have uh, separate repository definitions. And um, we try to share package definitions where we can, which is why we have a top level of, um, a top level of uh, devs and RPMs, because the naming schemes are usually slightly incompatible for packages. If we add another major OS family, we might have to add another top level section for that. And whenever you go through and you have to, and you're building out a new OS, you have to make sure that all these package names stay the same. And what happens with the build system is it goes through, it uh, checks to make sure that all of the packages that it needs uh, as laid out by the crowbar.yamls for the bar clamps are there in the crowbar build cache. Oh, uh, you have it as a dot still. There we are. Okay, so, the, so this is the build cache for each of the bar clamps. We host them all independently because that makes it easier to make the tarballs. And for this one, you can see we've got, um, we've only ever tried to build for Ubuntu 12.04, so those are the only packages that it'll have cached. And it's got a bunch of them. Basically everything that's different from what's on the uh, Beta 1 CD is going to be here. And everything that isn't part of it, like uh, Thin, for instance. <laughs> If it doesn't have if, if it doesn't have all the packages it needs, it will actually spin up a cheroot of the operating system that you're going to deploy on. So, for instance, um, on this one, uh, whenever Rob was doing the build, you saw that uh, one of the first things that it did was build a cheroot environment, and it uh, it it built up a cheroot environment based on uh, Ubuntu 12.04 beta, and it went out and it used uh, 
the operating system's native package tools to God and download all of the dependencies that it would need. Um, for Debian-based distros, it's just a, an app to get uh, download only. And uh, for Yum, it's we use a Yum downloader, I believe, to cache everything. So for SUS, it'll have to be zipper whatever that they whatever they happen to use for now. Once it has all the packages cached for all of the bar clamps, it goes through, creates tarballs for all the bar for all the bar clamps, and you can see those in build. And those are all the bar clamp tarballs that it that it builds. It then stages some uh, extra information that we need to be able to kick off the admin node, um, the install and install chef scripts, um, expanded versions of the tarballs. Um, it hack up it hacks up the init RDs so that uh, it'll automatically if you're netbooting it it'll automatically pick up the right seed files to do the to do the install of the admin node. And then at the very end, you get a shiny happy ISO. But the key to making sure that you get the right ISO is that in each of these directories, we have it uh, factored out so that there's a common directory for Red Hat and Ubuntu. Let's just go to the Ubuntu common one. We encapsulate some uh, build specific, some OS specific stuff in uh, the build lib file here. That tells us where to download ISO files for, what type of packages we're using, what arches to allow from packages, um, where to find packages in the cheroots, what packages we've seen, how to fetch the ISO, bunch of little ancillary helper functions. And so writing support for a new operating system basically involves making sure that uh, all of the variables and helper functions work correctly for that operating system. And the other part of that is uh, every operating system tends to have their own little set of quirks as to how exactly you, uh, bootstrap, chef, you, you bootstrap chef during the install of the admin node. And that's encapsulated in a file called chef install lib, which is sourced by install chef. And you basically have to have uh, functions that work on a new operating system that uh, have the names that are in these files. Like uh, update host name for how to update the host name, install base packages, installs the uh, minimal stuff that we need to bootstrap Chef. Ruby gems, Ruby, all that other fun stuff. Oh. How to bring Chef up. Uh, we have several things that we patch in Chef to make it work uh, the way we think it should, which we really need to get pushed upstream at some point. And yes, Greg, that was an ugly, or yeah, Greg, that was an ugly thing that you passed in. <clears throat> oh, the uh, fixed seg fault thingy. I didn't say bad, I said ugly. <laughs> yeah, Greg's, Greg, whose who's comment was that you or Greg? Oh, that's me. <laughs> that's Greg. Yeah, that's, I was oh, thinking that's going to be Greg. Yeah, that's evil. <laughs> yeah. And that is how we hack up uh, things to work around the three different versions of Rack that it seems that uh, we require well, not from everything. Well, not require, but... I, I'm not sure. I, I have serious questions for a bunch of people about how you manage gems and devs on their system that provide gems. Because mm. right now, if you install the dev and then another one in another location, they share each other's code. And that seems bad. And so that hack is to make Jeff and uh, technically rainbows work with Chef server on the same system. The, the irony be that Rack was supposed to be the universal thing that normalized all this stuff? Oh, great. 
And so, yeah, <laughs> well, and, and so it ends up that, you know, it normalizes it by every stack can, can require their own version of rack. <laughs> Which I don't know. <laughs> Our that solves the problem. <laughs> it's the previous statement about attraction. <laughs> yeah. Glad you're showing those lovely files. Thanks. Oh yeah. Well, th this is this is the stuff you need to touch to get Fedora, for instance, working. And so. Hopefully, you won't need that. This is the stuff that's abstracted out because it's basically identical across all the revisions of Ubuntu that we have. That's the weirdest thing to me, that they're sharing code with different packages. Like the point of putting them in two locations is so you can partition it. Oh, come on. That may have been the goal. Is it? <laughs> I'm, I'm over here reinstalling RVM because <laughs> RVM 192 is finding 191 packages. I'm like, uh, I'm post. So yeah, things should never find each other that are supposed to not find yeah. each other. Is it, so for, is it because you're not running completely independent Ruby? And they got a compiled path in, in Ruby? Well, they use a shared directory, and that's the problem. Even if it's a different version, oh. that thing installed over each other. Yeah, I give up. Yeah. <laughs> Back in Perl, yeah. User lib site Ruby. Yay! Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. It's supposed to be that. In theory. As you know, you, you found that it's not quite. <laughs> yeah, I, I also need two versions of GCC, so. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You want to keep going. Well, there's not much more to show unless you want okay, to no, see. Well, then, yeah. then it's, it, at some point, we want to turn it over to Matt. Yeah, to talk about, to talk about the, um, the chef side of all of this, because everything that we've seen right now is just for the build system, make sure it gets everything set up well, for. The operating system you want to run on. My story's not as entertaining. Oh. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, David Russell, um, is here who has some of the so I want to see if we can start in a little preview talk about something and see if folks have questions about something. Can we? Are you? Are we almost done with this? Um, uh, we're we're at a reasonable stopping point, Matt. Is that is that all right? We can talk about fun. I mean, that's. I'd like to hear about that. Um, okay. I, I got to duck out. For a of the like we're, 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 we should be fun. Let's let's. Uh, I understand you. Uh, you're not close Sorry. enough to the let's, mic. Let, yeah, let's. I think we're at a point to stop. Let's. Okay, let's make an about something.